Okay, so let's start. Uh, so welcome uh, to TCS Plus. Uh, today's talk is by Ola Svensson. Before we introduce the speaker, I'll briefly, I will go over the audience. And um, so the first group is from, sorry, uh, the first group is from Columbia. Hi, Columbia. Uh, then from Stanford, or Stanford. Then Kupchen is lead, uh, the group from Michigan, Michigan State. Um, then Sahan, I do not know where this group is from. Maybe one of you can introduce yourself. Uh, Sahan, well. Uh, then we have the group from UCSD. Hello. Uh, oops. Uh, then Syed from Shahid Behesti University, uh, Shavas Rao from NYU, Obergon from MIT. Um, so we are going to, uh, I guess some groups will trickle in as we, as the talk proceeds. So today's speaker is Ola Svensson um, and uh, so Ola is at uh, EPFL and um, he has done breakthrough, amount of breakthrough work in uh, traveling salesman problems, scheduling problems, and uh, the uh, complexity of matching, and has received several best paper awards for these works. And uh, today he's going to uh, talk about a constant factor approximation for the ATSP problem, thus resolving a decades old problem. Um, before we start to talk, I would like to remind you, uh, in a week from now, so not two weeks, in a week from now, we'll have uh, Vinod Vaikundnathan's, uh, um, so, so, uh, at DC in DCS Plus, and then we also have John Kellner lined up two weeks from then. So, hola, welcome. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, as uh, always. So, this is joint work with Jakob Tanask, who is also at EPFL, and uh, with Laszlo Weg, who is at LSE, so London School of Economics in London. So, this is me. So, it was fun to put me at the same level. So, let me just move me up so you can see the slides. All right, so let me start this presentation by answering a question I think most of you has, have asked yourself. And that's like, what's the cheapest possible way to visit the 24,978 cities of Sweden? So would you guess how, how long would the distance be to visit these biggest cities of Sweden? I guess it's hard to get it interactive, but thanks to Applegate, Bixby and others, we know that this is, you know, you can visit these cities with 72,500 kilometers. Okay, so they solved the optimal tour how to visit the 25,000 biggest cities of Sweden in 2004. And they did this using a, a heuristics based on a linear program, the same linear program as we will use. So this is a fun example because I'm from Sweden and Sweden has only 9 million inhabitants. So it's very impressive, but at the same time, you have to be very liberal in your definition of what a city means. So this means, you know, since they, I don't know how they identified that many cities in Sweden. Okay. So in any case, so this is the TSP problem. You want to find the shortest tour that visits n given cities. So here we have an example with seven cities and maybe that's a tour. So this is, uh, you know, one of the most well-studied benchmark problems in computer science. It was studied in the 19th century by Hamilton and Kirkman. We know Hamiltonian cycle and so on. And several books have been written about this problem. And, and it remains, you know, we don't completely understand in spite of all this research. So it remains a big open qu question what uh, efficient computation can accomplish. So uh, when studying this uh, question, Basically, two versions are studied. So the first one is symmetric. So that's where we assume that the distance going from V to U is the same as the distance going from U to V. Or the symmetric case where there is no such assumption. So it's more general. So distance from V to U could be free, but the distance from U to V could be 100. Okay? And that's the case we're going to consider today. So maybe. At the first sight, you know, asymmetric differences might seem unnatural. So let me have one slide motivating this. And, and, the, and the answer is, is if, you're not so, uh, mot uh, if you're not so convinced, then you could, should come and visit Lausanne because, you know, there's a big difference going uphill than downhill. So there's a very difference going, you know, in one direction to the other one. You could also think about skiing or one-way streets, okay? So now, now you are uh, convinced that it's a very important problem. So let's look at the formal definition. 
Uh, so we have as input an edge weighted die graph with vertex set V, edge set E, and a weight function W. So in this example here, this edge could have a weight one. Weight E, you know, you should think of weight to be cost or distance. So here uh, the weight is three, and here it's one, and there it's 5,000. So it's asymmetric. Then the goal is to find a tor that visits each vertex at least once. So, you know, maybe normally when you see the definition of TSP, you insist that you should not only visit each vertex at least once, but you should visit each vertex exactly once, right? That's the standard formulation. So the reason that they formulated as vertex at least once is because this is equivalent to assuming the triangle inequality. If we do not assume the triangle inequality, we cannot hope to do anything, okay? Even in the symmetric case. So in all the works that uh, I will mention and what we will consider, we assume the triangle inequality or equivalently, we will assume that we can visit each vertex at least once. So that's the definition. It will be convenient to look at an equivalent definition that is a little bit more graph theoretical. So instead of looking for a tor, we look for a minimum weight. Uh, Ola, can you can yes. you just pause for a minute? Yes. Uh, guys, I think somehow because of something, we are having only 10 people allowed. Uh, uh, more people were supposed to join. I'm trying to figure out if we can restart. Uh, <clears throat> uh, not sure what's going on. No, but, uh, uh, maybe it's best to uh, let the thing go. Uh, not sh if, okay, uh, I'm not sure what's going on, really. Uh, 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 I think he used to... Uh, okay, actually, Ola, just uh, uh, maybe just keep going. Just keep going. Uh, sorry for that. Just keep going. No worries. <laughs> sorry. So I keep going. So here, here it's, uh, yes, so that's the formulation, right? And an equivalent graph theoretic formulation that will be easier for us to work with is that we are looking for an edge set that's a multi set, so it might contain the same edge multiple times, multiple copies. And now we want to look for a connected. We want, this is that we want to visit every vertex. So it should be a connected multi set of edges that connects the whole graph, and it should be Eulerian. Eulerian means simply that the in degree should equal the out degree. That's clearly the case in the tour, and it turns out to be sufficient. So this is the graph theoretic formulation that is equivalent and the one that we will work with. So we're given an edge weight that directed graph, and we want to find a minimum weight connected Eulerian multiset of edges. Any questions? This is the formulation we're going to work on, so it's important that people understand this. So. so it needs to be connected, and it should have in degree equal to out degree. So in the symmetric case, this just means that the degree should be even. Here in the asymmetric case, we need the in degree to equal the out degree. All right. So now if we have the problem definition, let's look at uh, what's known. So here I will not uh, talk about the heuristics that we saw in the beginning, and I will just focus my attention to approximation arguments. We are interested in what's the best possible argument we can do with provable guarantees. And recall that the raw approximation algorithm is an algorithm that is efficient, it should be polynomial time, and it should have a good worst case guarantee, meaning that on any input, we should always find a solution so that the cost of the found solution is at most raw times the cost of the optimal solution. So here, if rho is equal to one, then it's an exact polynomial time algorithm. And if rho is equal to 1.01, .01, then the algorithm finds a solution with at most 1% higher cost. So we would like rho to be as small as possible. So let's now see what's known. And I just have to mention, you know, Christofides' work for symmetric uh, distances. So he gave a free house approximation algorithm uh, in the 70s for that case. And this remains the best. It's a notorious open question, can we do better than free house? And this is an intriguing question, question also, because we believe that we already have a stronger approximation, at least of the optimum value. Okay, so Helcorp, they introduced in the 70s as well, a heuristic for calculating a lower bound on a tor, which coincides, the value, coincides with the value of a linear program. And the conjecture is that this lower bound approximates the value within a factor of four thirds. Okay, so we believe that if we solve this linear program, we have a four thirds approximation on the optimum, but we don't know how to prove it. Okay. And we will see that a similar situation holds for a symmetric traveling assessment problem. 
but with a much bigger gap. All right, so sorry, that was about symmetrics. Let's go back to asymmetric. So here, the first argument with a provable guarantee was given by Fries, Galbiati, Mafioli. So it gives a log base 2m approximation for asymmetric TSP. So I would like to emphasize this, this is really a log base 2m, so no hidden constants. So the hidden constant here is 1. It's a very nice, beautiful, clean algorithm that I will have the chance to describe later. Okay. Then we skip the 90s, not too much, maybe for ATSB. <laughs> Sorry, maybe. I hope I don't miss some important results or upset someone. So then in 2000, it was also proved that this MPR to approximate ATSB within 1.01. So we basically ruled out the possibility of a PTAS, but that's far away from the log and approximation by Fiskal Viati Mafioli. This low bound was simplified recently by Kapinski, Lampis, and Schmidt to give a low bound of 75 over 74, but it's still very close to one. So at this point, the best algorithm was still the log base 2 and approximation by Fries, Galbiati, Mafioli. And then, you know, in 2003, there was the first improvement, and that was to replace the constant 1 by constant 0 0.99 by Blaser. So this, this might look like a small improvement. So I, I imagine like one of the main motivations here is that you, if you set cover, right? It's a relate, somehow looks like a related problem if you think about it for a while. And there it turns out that the natural logarithm is the exact ratio, what we can achieve in polynomial time. So this, ra this result here showed that log base 2n is not the ratio for the ATSP problem. This was further pushed by Kaplan et al. And the best currently known ratio based on pushing the techniques by Fris, Mafiati, Gabriel. So all these papers pushes the same technique, which is based on repeated cycle covers that I will explain later. So here I think is the world record using that technique, which is two thirds times log base 2n. Then in 2010, I think a big thing for ATSB happened. So then Asapur, uh, Gurman, Smadi, Oveskaran and Saberi, they introduced a new approach, which is much more related to the Kastufides approach, where you find a spanning tree. You forget about the in-degree equal to out-degree constraint. You find a spanning tree, and then you fix in-degree and out-degree. To fix the in-degree and out-degree in ATSB, you need some property called thinness of the spanning tree that you find. And they show that you can find that property good enough to get the log and over log long and approximation. Okay, so that's also a very nice paper. So that was the status at 2010. So basically, we didn't really know what the approximability of ITSP is. So MPR to approximate within 75 over 74. Best algorithm has a super constant approximation guarantee. And you know, this is pretty amazing because the only thing we know is that the standard linear program relaxation or Helcarp relaxation from many decades ago cannot do better than two. And it was conjectured that it does a constant by Germans. I don't know if he conjectures a two, but maybe I can conjecture two. Okay. Uh, he, definitely they conjectured a constant. So we knew that we had a linear program that should approximate this problem within a constant, but we didn't have the techniques to prove it. So that seemed, seemed like a difficult problem. So I did a scientific comparison to, <laughs> to illustrate the progress. So you can do the scientific progress. So let's say we have a log n approximation for 80s being the 80s. That's how the mobile phones looked like that. Then, then you know, the mobile phones progressed very rapidly to 2010. The, the, the ATSP <laughs> ratio progressed much slower. And then we had this log n over log log n, which, which introduced a new method. So now the hope is, can we use this result to push further down the ratio? So, so, uh, so to summarize, there was two, two approaches. And these approaches are motivated in the following way. So remember that I defined ATSB as the problem of finding a connected Eulerian graph. The first approach forgets about connectivity. So let's just maintain that we always have an Eulerian graph. And it's easy to find a cycle cover. So we can find a cycle cover that connects part of our graph now we do a new cycle cover to connect the graph a little bit more and so on and repeat this. And you need to repeat that log base 2 n times to get your final solution. We will see that later on. The other approach based on fin trees is based on, let's forget about the layering condition. Well, it's easy to find a connected graph, a spanning tree, and then we fix up the in degrees and the out degrees. Okay, so that was the fin trees approach. 
So after their publication, it was also used the fin tree approach to get a constant factor approximation in the case of planar and bounded genus graphs. And then more recently in a major developer, I would say, uh, it was an exponential improvement in the boundary and integrality gap by Nima Nari and Sharyanovis Garan. And this uses heavy machinery. So it uses a generalization of the Kelson Singer conjecture, which was proved by Adam Marcus, Nikhil Srivastava, and Daniel Spearman. And therefore, I write bound and integral gap because it's not known whether this heavy machinery can be done in polynomial time. So this gives a bound on the integral gap of the linear program, implying a so called estimation algorithm. We can estimate the optimum value with this guarantee, but we don't know how to efficiently find a tor, a solution of this uh, guarantee. Okay. And around a little bit later, around the same time, we also introduced a third approach uh, to approximate ATSB. The, I call this a local connectivity ATSB. So it's an easier problem in some sense. And this is more related to the side curve approach in the, main, in the sense that you maintain a linearity and you work towards making the graph connected. And here we get use this approach uh, to get a constant factor approximation in the special case of node weighted matrix. Okay, so if you want to get a constant factor for ATSB, this looks like a pretty hard route to follow. A lot of smart people have tried this for a long time to get the cycle cover approach work uh, to a constant. I will describe maybe one approach to make it work in constant later on. And uh, and the thin tree approach is more fresh, so this could be a viable route, but you know, what least people have tried is to work on this kind of method. Can we use that result to get a constant factor for general matrix? And that's what uh, I, Jacob, and Laszlo tried, and we worked hard. And what we ended up with uh, is a constant factor approximation for, for two different edge weights. So then we thought, like, okay, so we push this method to the extreme. This looks like really hard, even to get up to like four edge weights or three edge weights. We, it was too complicated. Uh, so there we was. Uh, we were a little bit uh, pressed, but it turns out that uh, we can all, now we could overcome those obstacles to get a constant factor approximation algorithm for uh, any metric with respect to this uh, standard LP relaxation. So the unoptimized constant in the paper is 5,500. You could optimize it a lot, I guess, but you could only get. I only would guess that you can go down to a couple of hundreds. Okay, so it's very far away from the the lower bound of two. So here you would need very, it would, it's a very interesting problem to develop new techniques to get closer to two. Okay, so we don't know. So I presented, do, yeah. Uh, do we know something about like the Eulerian approach? Do we know like, oh, it cannot go further than some particular like multiple of log n or, or it's still conceivable that it could go further down? Yeah, yes, good question. So. I think the following is known. So if you always select the min cost cycle cover in each iteration, then the analysis log base 2n is tight. So what they did to get like two for log 2n, you're careful in the selection of the cycle covers. But you could imagine an alg a natural algorithm is the following. You solve the linear program and you sample a cycle cover according to the marginals, according to such certain distribution. This we don't know if that would work or not. It depends on which distribution over cycle covers you select. Uh, depending on this uh, linear problem. We just don't know how to analyze it. I will talk more about that later. And uh, you will see maybe there is a natural approach, but we don't know how to make it work. <clears throat> yeah, so I, I, I presented this like we were stuck at two edge weights. So how come uh, we could do the general case? So the main difference, uh, maybe the key difference, high level difference between the two papers is that in the two edge weight case, we try to use this local connectivity approach for a general problem immediately. Whereas here we present a sequence of reductions and each reduction gives more and more structure. And as I hope I will be able to convince you, in the end, we will have so much structure, so the resulting problem is actually easy to solve, okay? So instead of trying to solve the whole problem immediately, we give you know, a, a path of uh, reductions, and at the end of the day, it's very easy. Oh, well, very easy. But you know, this might look frightening, it's a long path, but I was like stressed that it's modular, so you, you know I don't know what Pirates likes to do as a break, but you can take you <laughs> you can take some ROM and then you can uh, take some uh, I don't know some buffing break, so you can it's pretty modular uh, as I will explain. Okay, so to, more seriously, uh, 
this is the uh, reduction. So first we reduce to something we call laminar weighted instances, then to irreducible instances, then to vertebrate pairs. That was a word that I didn't know before this paper. Lasto was <laughs> the inventor of the word vertebrate pairs. And then, then we have so much structure that we can solve it using local connectivity. Okay, so let me stress again, this is highly modular. You can read this one day, forget about most things, then read this one day, forget about most things, read this another day, forget about most things, finally read this. Okay, and I try to do the presentation in the same way. So I will have this goldfish on the slide when it's something you should probably remember for next time, for the next part. So uh, I will not have time to, as I said, I cannot talk about the whole thing, but I will have time to, I think, to explain enough reductions so that you will see that we get a very structured instance that you can hope to solve. Okay. Any questions so far? Except the psychic cover. So now I, I will start to explain what do I talk about, why, what's this laminar weighted instances and, uh, and how can we obtain them. All right, so the picture looks like that. So basically here we will use the amazing power of LP duality to give a very nice structure on the weights on the edges. So you know, in ATSP, right, you're given a graph with arbitrarily edge weights on the edges in the graph. Now we show to you that by LP duality, we can actually assume that the graph has a very nice structure on the edge weights. Okay. So we will use the linear program. So let me introduce the linear program. So recall the, the definition, we have a connected Eulerian multigraph. This means that the integral is equal to the out degree. So now we will write the linear program based on this. We will have a variable for each edge, so x, u, v, that equals intuitively the number of times we traverse that edge. Okay. Now you want to minimize the weight of your tor. So that's just summing over all the edges, the weight of that edge times the number of times you traversed it. Now the constraints should say that the Solution should be Eulerian, meaning that the out degree should equal the in degree, and it should be connected. So to write the out degree, we just say that the sum, this means that the sum of x values of the edges going out of v is equal to the sum of x values of the edges going into v. So that's a linear constraint. We write that for every vertex. And now to avoid subtors, so we're not happy, we say that for every set s, we should have at least one edge entering S and one edge exiting S. So that means that if we sum up both the entering edges and outgoing edges, we should have at least two. So let me define this notion. So maybe, so I have a set S. Delta plus S is the set of outgoing edges. Delta minus S is the set of incoming edges. Delta S is just the union. So again, here I have the sum of X values that go out of V is equal to the sum of x values going into v. x delta s just means the sum of x values of the edges entering s and exiting s. So in any integral tor, right, you should, for any subset of words, you should enter once, at least once, and exit at least once. So we have that that should be at least two. This is the standard LP relaxation called the Halkar relaxation. You can solve it in polynomial time by either devising a separation oracle or writing a equivalent compact formulation. Okay, that's, that's well known. Okay. So I will write the, the Helcorp relaxation here. And here I give you an instance to solve. Okay, let's find a good tour in this instance. So we have a linear program. Well, if we have a, a linear program, we usually solve it. <laughs> so we solve the linear program. We obtain the, oh, so in this picture, this uh, uh, blue numbers is just the edge lengths, so the weights of the edges. So we solve the linear program, then we get the red, uh, the black numbers, which is the number of times we traverse that edge. So this edge is traversed three times. This edge is traversed one time. This edge is traversed zero times, one time, one time. If you sum up the edge weights, it will be 22. 3 times 4 plus 1 times 1 plus 1 times 1 plus 1 times 2 and so on is equal to 22. You can see that in my, 
so okay i have bad imagination you can see that uh, in the sense that it's an integral solution so we were lucky but that's not the point here so i just <laughs> that's just because of my imagination but we can also see that we have some zero edges so the lp basically tells us you should under no circumstances use use these edges in your in your solution so let's just forget about these edges if we forget about these edges the linear program will have the same value because it didn't use these edges. And if we can find a tor in the subgraph, that will be a tor in our original graph. So we can just forget them and look at the smaller instance, and that's an equivalent instance. Okay? So we can forget about all the edges with zero value, and we get a cleaner picture. Okay? And now all the edges remaining have a positive LP value. That will be important. So everybody that was remaining has a positive output. Let me clean up the picture to replace, since I had such a bad imagination, so I selected a primal solution to be integral. Let me just replace that three by three copies, this two by two copies, and remove the ones to clean up the picture. Otherwise, I have too many numbers. So this is the remaining edges in our LP solution, or the support of our LP solution, if you so wish. Now we want to understand, do these edges have any special weight structure. So I, I gave away to you that uh, we should use LP duality. So what can we say about edges that had a strictly positive primal value? What kind of solution could we expect to have? What kind of structure could we expect them to have using LP duality? So if an edge has a positive, uh, uh, edge value in the primal, so Xe is strictly positive, what would that mean for the dual, for a dual optimal solution? Uh, so, so, you know, um, it, uh, maybe you know this, by complementarity slackness, every positive value in the primal corresponds to a tight constraint in the dual. Every positive value, positive value in the dual solution corresponds to a tight constraint in the primal. That's if and only if. So if you have an optimal primal and dual solution, any positive value in the primal corresponds to a tight constraint in the dual, every positive value in the dual corresponds to a tight constraint in the primal. Okay. So to understand if these edges have any structure, we will look into the dual. Please interrupt me at any point. Okay, so, so now we write down the dual, it's impossible to understand, so we will take it slowly, okay? So the dual will have a variable for each constraint in the primal. So we have these constraints. So the dual will have a alpha v for each of these constraints. We call it the vertex potential for each vertex. It will have a variable for each cut constraint, so it's a variable ys for each cut s. And then it will have a constraint for each variable in the primal. So it will have a constraint for, for all u, v in E. Okay? And that constraint simply says uh, that the sum of the y values of the cuts crossing that edge, or cutting that edge, plus the tail potential minus the head potential should be at most edge weight. Okay. So let's do some examples because that's tough to, to uh, think about. Yeah, so here, sorry, so here I depict a dual optimal solution. So the numbers on the vertices is the vertex potential. So six is the alpha value for this vertex. And the red sets are the cut values. So ys for this set here is one. Ys for this set here is two. Ys for this set here is four. Ys for this set here is four. All other cuts have y value zero. So this is a dual solution. So the, the, we can just verify that the strong duality holds. So we have an optimal dual solution. So we have one plus two plus four plus four. So that's eight, 10, 11. And the objective function is two times this sum. So the, the dual value is two times 11. So it's also 22. So, so, so luckily I didn't mess up. So strong duality holds here. Okay, so let's now verify the constraints of the dual. So let's look at an edge here in the primal. So it had a positive primal value. So that edge, we should verify this constraint. So that edge crosses one tight set with a positive y value. So this sum here, sum of ys for this edge is four. The tail potential is three. So it's four plus three. 
and the head potentially is six, so minus six. So that's equal the edge weight one. Okay, and we need that it's at most to edge weight. This edge, well, he crosses two red sets, two plus one, his tail potential is four, minus the head potential is six. That's again equal to his edge weight. This edge, well, he's crossing that tight set, so it's two plus two minus four, which is equal to zero, which was his edge weight. Finally, this guy, he's crossing no tight sets. He has zero there, and then it's plus six minus two, which is equal to four. Good. So you can see that everybody ended up with equality, and that's because I kept only the edges with a positive x value. So now if I'm given an optimal primal solution and an optimal dual solution, I know that every remaining edge corresponds to a tight dual constraint. Okay. So that's complementarity slackness for you. So let's see what happens. But complementary slackness for every edge. So we have a tight dual constraint for every edge. So now think about it. So this alpha u and minus alpha v, they are vertex potentials. So what happened if I just normalize my weight function with, uh, with uh, vertex potentials in the sense that I increase the weight if I, well, let me write it here. So I replace the weight function wv by the weight function minus alpha u plus alpha v. So I take minus the tail plus the head. If I do that for every weight, every edge, what happens to Eulerian solutions? You know, Eulerian solutions have equal in degree and equal out degree. So I get minus equal as many times as I get plus. Okay. So if I write this normalization as W prime, where I normalize with the vertex potentials, you know, it can be any vertex potentials. Then for any Eulerian edge set F, I have that the old weight function, the weight of that weight function is equal to the weight of the new weight function where I normalized it with the vertex potentials. So just as a, to see that, let's look at a small uh, uh, cycle. That's an Eulerian graph. We have that the weight W prime is the weight, original weight of the AB plus, oh, I, I, I messed up the plot, but it's the same. So plus alpha A minus alpha B, Weight of BC plus alpha B minus alpha C. Alpha B cancels out. Here, weight of CA plus alpha C. Alpha C cancels out minus alpha A. Alpha A cancels out. So just because the in degree is equal to out degree, the vertex potentials cancels out. Okay, you're with me with this. So this is actually the intuition. How I think the intuition how Helcar proposed to give a lower bound for TSP for the symmetric variant. So what they did is to start with vertex potential zero everywhere, find a minimum spanning tree, that's a lower bound of a tor. Now update the vertex potential by increasing the vertex potential of high degree vertices, resolve the minimum spanning tree problem. Okay, and now they did that in a kind of multiple weight update fashion, I guess, so as to get like vertex potentials that gets the best possible lower bound. And that coincides with this linear program because what I'm saying here, that the dual is these vertex potentials plus these cut constraints. Okay, that was a side remark. So we have some vertex potentials that we can just incorporate and normalize our weight function. So let's just do that in this example. So we normalize with our vertex potential to get a new weight function. And that weight function, W prime, is just, notice that the edge weight of everybody is just the the, the cut value that it crosses. So the edge weight of this edge here is just one because it crosses one tight set in the dual with a value of one. The, the weight of this edge is two because it crosses this tight set in the dual and this set in the dual with value two. The weight of this edge, ooh, the weight of this edge is three because it crosses these guys, two plus one, so it's three. Okay. So I just normalized using the vertex potential of the dual and now I have a weight function where every weight is equal to the y values of the set it crosses. So we can just forget about the weight, uh, vertex potentials. Okay, so what happened? We started with something complicated with no structure. We dropped the zero edges. We used complementary slackness. We normalized with vertex potentials. We got an optimal primal x and a dual y zero now because we already normalized with the vertex potentials. 
so that the edge weight of every remaining edge is just the sum of the values of the cuts it crosses. Okay, so, so that's the structure we have. So that's pretty nice. So every weight of every edge remaining is just the sum of the y values of the uh, sets it crosses. Okay, but we, we agree this, we want more structure. We want to squeeze out the last bit of information we can get from LP duality. And, and, uh, and uh, why, why can we get more information? So we only use complementary to slackness in one direction, right? We used it on the primal saying that X value is positive. That means that the dual constraint is tight. We also have it in the other direction. So if we look at the support of the dual solution, then by complementarity slackness, the corresponding constraint in the primal should be tight. That means that for everybody here, every cut with a positive value, there's one unit of flow going in, in the LP solution and one unit of flow going out. Okay. So this means that the LP tells us that each of these sets with a positive Y value should be entered once and exited once in an optimal tour. Okay. Now the final uh, structural result that we will use where I will not explain you everything is that uh, by by now, fairly standard and crossing techniques, we can assume that L is a lamina family. That means that there is no two sets intersect non-trivially. So every, any two sets in L are either disjoint, like these two sets are disjoint, or one is a subset of the other. So this has been used for these kind of problems now for a while. It was used in, you know, Jane's groundbreaking works for uh, iterative rounding for survival network design. It was used in Singh and Lau's, uh, Lau and Singh's uh, paper on mean degree span increase. And it was used for TSP, not in iterative rounding, but before to get structural results by Cornelius and others already in the 80s. Okay. But that is to say that we can assume that these sets form a lamina family. Okay, so just to repeat, what we can assume now is that we have a lamina weighted instance. That's what we call lamina weighted. We have x, y to be primal and dual solutions. The support of the dual solution is a lamina family. Nice to be drawn like this. Every set is this, two sets are disjoint, or one is a subset of the other. And this defines the instance. Okay. Of course, I didn't draw the edges. So the weight function is implicitly, yeah, so this is a tight set. So the in degree of this set is equal to one. The out degree with respect to the LP solution X is one. Of course, the weights are now implicitly defined by just saying the weight of every edge is equal to the value of the set it crosses. So the weight of this edge would be two plus five plus one, which is eight. The weight of this edge is one plus three plus two plus five. And if you have the, anti-parallel edge, then the weight would be the same. So it's important that, uh, that the graph is not complete, right? So we, we worked on a subgraph. So in the subgraph that we worked in the G, then the weight of every edge is equal to the value it crosses. And what I, what I explained to you is that by LP duality, we have that the row approximation algorithm for laminar weighted instances just yields a row approximation algorithm for general ATSP. This is the weight functions you have to consider if you want to approximate with respect to the health corp relaxation. Okay. And for future notation, I will just use the health corp low bound to denote opt, and that's two times the value of the sets, the cut sets. So it's one plus three plus two plus one plus five plus two times two everything. So it will be 28, the health corp low bound in this example. So it's two times the value of these cut sets. Okay. So if you're completely lost, now is the, the fish. Okay, so if you lost me there, basically what you have to remember is that now we have reduced our task to this. We are given a lamina set of cuts, the weights on the cuts, and the edge weights in the graph are just the sum of these weights that it crosses. Okay. So that's what we call lamina weighted instance. Any, any questions on this point? So this was the first reduction using LP. I think I, like, if you followed, basically I explained everything except the uncrossing, which this is pretty standard. So that's, uh, that's the first reduction.
All right, so so just to, just remember that. Oh, there is a is there a question? So I can hear some noise in my. So you can you type the question? We can't hear you. I think they can, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I think it's best if they type the question, maybe, because we couldn't. Where can I see? I cannot see. Uh... Uh, well, I mean, they haven't typed anything. I'm monitoring that. But uh, if they type something, uh, 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 maybe you can go ahead and uh, once they type something, I'll, I'll be there. All right. So let's remember that this is what we have to solve. So uh, and now I will explain, uh, uh, well, uh, the next step, and we want to have more uh, more structure to be able to solve a problem, right? So, so this is what we call irreducible instances. So this is a picture of uh, uh, some game, and the point here is that there is a very long path from where you enter and exit uh, this uh, game board, and and what we will see is that the irreducible instances are those instances in which there are very long paths from where you enter a set S, tight set S in our laminar family and you exit, okay? And this, I hope maybe this will make sense after I describe what it is. And here the basic idea is, uh, is simple. So just, you know, if you want to have a recursive algorithm and still obtain a constant factor approximation algorithm, that's fine if your recursive calls is on an instance with a smaller optimum value, with a smaller smaller LP value. So I will explain this idea in a simpler setting, maybe in the cycle cover approach. So maybe I will answer the question I got in the beginning of the talk, how, how one possibly could get a constant factor with a cycle cover approach. And then we'll get back to our setting and see how to implement it there. Okay, so now I let's take a detour. So I made a word, you know, sorry for the bad <laughs> joke with the words. <laughs> It will come one more, so you have to prepare yourselves. Okay, so let's make a detour and consider the repeated, the very nice repeat cycle cover approach by Fris, Galbiati, and Mafioli from 82. Okay, so remember, their approach was based on forget about connectivity and let's uh, always maintain no layering graph and build connectivity iteratively. So the first step, they find a cycle cover. Well, cycle cover is a special case of uh, a tour, so the cycle cover has cost of most opt. But it doesn't connect the whole graph. So now let's select the vertex inside each component, like these green vertices here. Now that's a smaller instance. So we can find a cost, a cycle cover, of course, at most opt of that smaller instance, which is at most opt of the whole instance. So we have against the cost of the green cycle cover is at most opt. And now we have two components. We select two representative and resolve again. So here in this example, the total cost is at most three times opt. So the cost here was three times because we did three iterations. So in the worst case, we all cycles will have length two, so we need to repeat log base two n times. So each time it's cost opt. So there's two ways of improving this analysis. One, or at least two. So one way is to say, hey, I cannot be this unlucky all the time to only find cycles of length two. I should make more progress and thereby fewer iterations. Another way that we will pursue is to say the following, weren't we a little bit pessimistic saying that every time we pay opt of the whole solution, after all, when we selected the first cycle cover, we made some progress, so we could hope that the second cycle cover on a smaller instance is cheaper, and the, the, the orange cycle cover is even cheaper and so on. So this is what I mean that recursive algorithms, they are fine, as long as you can prove that the value of your instances drop. Okay. So suppose we run the cycle cover approach, and now what happens if the value of opt would drop, let's say by factor nine over 10 each time? Well, then we don't have to worry about the number of iterations, right? Because you will have this nice fast decreasing sum, 
so 9 over 10 to the power of i, where i is the number of iterations. So if you sum this up, even with infinitely many iterations, you will have at most 10 times of the approximation. So then you will be very happy and, and you can write your paper. So we don't know how to implement such a strategy with a side cover approach. We don't know how to select the side covers in each iteration so that to guarantee a drop in the LP value or drop an opt. Uh, so this is a natural approach that many have tried, but nobody has succeeded. But we will pursue this uh, strategy now using the structure of laminar weighted instances. Okay. Are you with me? So. I can recursively solve my problems as long as the smaller instance have a smaller opt value. Okay, so now the second, le retour, that's the second, <laughs> second word play. So this is uh, the return in French. All right, so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, so now, okay, remember we have this setting, we have laminar weighted, uh, we have sets here, the edge weight is just the sum of the values of those. And, and to implement the recursive approach, we will need uh, two, two concepts. That's what I call a contraction and a lift. Okay, so let's look at the contraction. So this is a laminar weighted instance. If I look at the set here, set S, maybe this set here, remember that this was a tight set, meaning that the LP value of the incoming edges, they summed up to one. So for example, this was one fourth, one fourth, one fourth, one fourth. The total X value coming into this set is one. Similarly, the total X value going out of the set was one. So maybe one third, one third, one third. So I could simply contract that set to get a smaller laminar weighted instance. So I replaced that whole set by a single vertex. So that's just a standard graph contraction. So now the LP says, hey, you should visit this vertex exactly once. Okay. So this is, you know, G, X, and the lamina family, that's just a standard contraction. But it remains to somehow what kind of Y value should we set for this set here that replaced all these sets? Okay, so that's the question mark. That's the only thing we need to specify. And we can contract any of the sets in our instance. We could also contract this bigger set into a single vertex. And now the question is, again, how do we specify this Y value? So that's what I mean by contraction. To understand how we set this Y value, it's instructive to look at how do we use this contraction in our recursive algorithm. Okay. Well, we have a smaller instance so let's just recursively find a tor in this instance. Okay, like that, that's a tor. Now we want to lift that. So that's what I call a lift. So I want to lift that tor back into, maybe not a tor, but a sub tor here. So I just start, okay, I take the same edges in the same order. So I take this, I enter here. Ah, but now I have to exit over here. That's not, that's not the same vertex. So I have entered here, I exited over here. So that, uh, what, what can we do? So I need this to, to patch this up in some way, right? My tour walked in, this, in the contracted instance, I walked like that. And now in the lift, I started here, I walk, 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 I enter, but now I have to exit there. I want this to be an Olerian instance and connected sub tour. What can I do? There's like what the simplest possible way to fix this. Okay, I claim that the simplest, but well, just add a shortest path from the end, from this vertex where we entered to the vertex where we want to exit. So we just add a shortest path. Okay, and now we continue the tour, we enter here and we exit there, so we add a shortest path. That's what we call a lift. Okay, so again, we will use the contraction to contract a big set in a laminar family into a single vertex. We find a tor in that smaller instance that will lift back into a sub tor in the original instance. I say a sub tor because although this thing here visits everything outside the contracted set, it might not visit some guys inside the contracted set. Because it's not a tor, it's a sub tor, right? Because I just added the shortest paths. So I cannot guarantee that I visit everything inside this set. So now let's get back to how we set this question mark. 
We want to set this question mark so that we are sure to pay for this rewiring inside a set. So be sure to pay for these shortest paths. Okay. So we set Y value of new set to pay for maximum possible cost of all possible ways to enter and exit this set. So in this example, maybe the worst possible way was to enter here and exit here, and the shortest path actually crosses every set. So in that way, you have to put the question mark to be the sum of these sets that it crosses, so 5 plus 2 plus 2 plus 1 plus 4 plus 3. Okay, so that would be that you put the question mark to be 17. Okay, so let me just skip that and say, so if we put this question mark to 17, let's say, say why it pays for the lift, okay? So we found a tour in the contracted instance. Okay, and then we lifted it back to, uh, to the original uh, instance. So clearly everything outside the contracted instance pays the same. So we can, in the, in the difference in cost, we can just forget about everything outside. So now we have to worry about the cost of each visit to the contracted set. So in the contracted tour, right, when I, when I entered here and exited there, I paid 17 to enter and 17 to exit. So I paid two times 17. Well, actually, yeah, well, I entered here and exited there, I paid two times 17. Now let's look at what do I pay when I entered here and exited there. Well, I paid to enter, I paid five plus two on this edge. Then the shortest path played two plus two times two plus two times, no, time plus four plus three, the edges I crossed. And then to exit, I paid three plus four again. So in, 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 to summarize, I paid all the sets that I cross times two. So I paid two times five plus two plus two plus four plus three minus what I paid over here. Maybe what I said was uh, not so important exactly the five plus two and so on. What is important is that by definition, we selected this 17 to pay for any way we enter and exit. So for sure, this is at most zero. And similarly, this visit, the second visit to the set was even cheaper, but we again paid two times 17 in the contracted instance. So the way I selected 17 was to make sure that the change of cost is at most zero. So I have the fact that the lift here is not more expensive than the cost of the tour in the contracted instance. That's the way how I set this weight here. Okay. That's, that's just the definition, set the weight here so that you pay for the most possible way of and most expensive way of entering and exiting a set. So I have a question actually. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you very well. Uh, so is it obvious that this 17 is finite always? <laughs> yes, I knew this question would come up, so I should have prepared. But yeah, yes, no, it's not obvious. Uh, so so let me come back to this fact I skipped. Okay. Okay, so first one can prove that there exists always a path from a vertex that you enter a tight set to a vertex you exit a tight set. Actually, there exists always a path from a vertex that you enter to a tight set to every other vertex in that tight set. The intuition why this should hold is the following. The linear program tells you that you should enter this set exactly once. But if you should enter this set exactly once, well, then you need to visit every other vertex before going out, right? So by the cut, if you play around with the cut constraints, this will be hold by linear program. Because the only way that you can enter a set once and exit a, a set once in an integral tour would be to have an Hamiltonian path inside. So that's the intuition why we can always find this path inside from the entering to the exit. And now, Similarly to uh, a generalization of the fact that if you take a shortest path, you can assume that it doesn't have any cycles, right? So you visit each vertex exactly once, at most once. You can generalize this fact to tight sets. So you can say that the number of times we enter a tight set is at most once. So this means that we will cross each tight set at most two times, but that's exactly the value of, uh, of the LP on this set. So, so in fact, not only that it's finite, we can prove that the contraction never increases the LP value. Does that answer your question?
you have to do some sport. <laughs> yes, it does things. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, yes. So I, I can answer this question also by drawing, but uh, that's that's intuition. Okay, so that's a very good question. It's not obvious at all, and you have to think about it and and so on. But it turns out that you can always find paths so that you cross each tight, you enter each tight set at most once, so the contraction never increases in cost. So actually, what I drew here was the worst possible case that the contraction has the same cost as the original instance. Okay, so let me just summarize if everybody didn't follow everything here. So let's just summarize what we need to know about contraction. So fact, contraction does not increase the LP value. That's by Ilya's very good question. Lift no more expensive than Tor. That's by design. We set the value here to pay for this rewiring. Somewhat negative fact though, is that the lift back to the original instance is not a Tor, right? It's a sub Tor because we are not necessarily visiting every vertex inside a tight set S. It visits everything outside, but not inside. Okay. But now we will apply our recursive ID. So if the contraction costs a significant increase in the value, so if this smaller instance has a much smaller LP value, then we can use the remaining budget we get to complete the tour inside here. Okay. So that's the implementing the recursive strategy. And to formalize what we mean by uh, 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 decreasing the LP value in a contraction, we, we define what we say a reducible set. So a, a tight set or a set in our lamina family L is reducible if the worst way to answer exit cross at most a weighted three, four fraction of the sets inside S. Okay, so let's take an example. So here is a set S. The total value inside is two plus two, one, four, three. In this, if this set, so that's 12, so if this set should be reducible, then the worst way to enter and exit should cross sets of value at most nine to be reducible. So if we look at this case, the worst way to enter and exit, well, it crosses all the tight sets of value. So it, has a, it crosses sets of value 12. So that's an irreducible instance because to be reducible, it should cross sets of value at most nine. If we look at this case instead, if this is the worst possible way of entering an exit, this crosses the set two plus two plus one plus four, which is nine. So this is exact, this is just reducible. So why am I doing this? Because if this is the worst way of entering an exit, I do, I, the LP value will decrease because it's cheaper than what the LP tells me I have to pay in order to visit all these vertices. And we say that an instance is irreducible if no set L is reducible. So that's the concept of irreducible instances. And that's why I had this picture of the long paths. Okay. So now maybe the main, yeah, the main theorem we're going to prove here is that uh, in this talk is that the row approximation for irreducible instances actually yields an eight row approximation error for laminar weighted instances and that's therefore general ATSB. So this means that if we can approximate irreducible instances, then we are done. And to prove this, we will use the recursive approach. So suppose someone gave you a row approximation error for, for irreducible instances. And we will use this to just give a eight row approximation for any instance, any laminar weighted instance. Okay. So given a laminar weighted instance, if instance is already irreducible, well, simply run your algorithm to get a row approximate tour. That's better than I promised you. I promised you an eight row approximate tour. So life is great. Now, if the instance is not irreducible, what can we say? Well, the instance is not irreducible because there are some reducible sets. So now we select a minimal reducible set. So this minimal will be important soon. You will see why. So S here is a minimal reducible set, meaning that every set inside is irreducible. Now we contract its set. So now it's 14 because it's an, uh, it was 17 when we had to pay for everything. 14, so the LP value dropped. Now we find a tour here. It's an eight row approximate tour. Okay, so recursive call returns an eight row approximate solution T on smaller instance. So it's just eight row opt minus something. So if I write out the math, it's two row minus something. Forget, this is just some, some remaining budget because this has smaller value than here. 
Okay, so we will see why why this makes sense soon. Okay, what is important is that it's eight rho opt minus something positive. Now we lift that back into a lift. We know that the weight of this lift is at most the weight of the tor. So everything we have to do is to complete the lift into a tor, again using our argument A, while paying at most this remaining budget that we got from the recursive call on the instance with a smaller optimum value. Okay, so that's what we have to do to finish the proof. Complete to tor while paying at most two rho times this two times the sum of y values inside the set S. Okay, remember that the lift visited everything outside us, so we only have to connect unvisited vertices inside us, like this one and that one. I will explain this with a simplifying assumption. So suppose we had that the following. So instance obtained by only looking at the inside the set S is itself a feasible instance. So somehow the Halkarp solution is also feasible inside this set S by just removing everything that's going out and in. This is a simplifying assumption that is not true in general. Okay, But let's just assume that this is true. What can we say about this instance that we get by inducing on the set S? It's an irreducible instance since S was selected by a minimal reducible set. Right? If it's every set here has to be irreducible because otherwise we would have selected this before. The LP value is two times the, the, the sets inside us. So it's two times two plus two plus one plus four plus three. That's exactly what we had here in the save. By the, basically, we define it so that it's exactly the same, but this two times here is exactly the same thing as these two times. So now we have an irreducible instance with small LP value. We can use our algorithm A to find a raw approximate solution there. So this is better than what we needed. We needed two raw and we found a raw approximation for that. And that, that's our green solution. So that's a better than a factor two than we need. So let me just repeat what we did. Okay, so we're given an instance, we select a minimal reducible set, we contract and recursively find lift, that's an odd eight raw approximation. We have some remaining budget because the contracted instance dropped in value. Then under simplifying assumption, we found uh, using A, a tor inside that set of value at most raw times the LP value of the solution inside that set. Summing that up, we got a tor of value at most A to rho opt minus raw times two times blah, blah, blah. Okay, so that's, that's great. Of course, the reason that I have this slack in my proof is because our simplifying assumption is not true in general. So in the paper, uh, we define a more complicated operation to induce on the set S that makes us lose another factor of two. So you will get the two times here and that you will get eight. Okay. But here the key idea is we can contract. If we get an instance of smaller value, we can use the remaining body to complete the tour inside us. Okay, so now if you, if you got lost, the goldfish is back. And what you should remember is that now we can concentrate on re irreducible instance. So we have, so, we have reduced the whole problem of approximating ATSP to, uh, to that of uh, uh, approximating irreducible instances. <clears throat> Any questions on this? It went a little bit quick, but uh, hopefully, yeah, get the main idea. All right, so let me now explain why intuitive. Uh, yes. So actually, uh, is there some intuition for the fact that three, four you've got in the definition of reducible? Like why that? Uh, I see. You select anything. Uh, I think like close. You, I think maybe more intuitively, ninety-nine percent. Then you will get uh, if you select like uh, reducible. If you drop the output value with one percent, here we say like we should drop one fourth of whatever is inside. But you know then you will get 100 instead of 8. So, yeah. Basically, as long as we can make sure that the output value drops with a constant what is inside the set S, then we're fine. So, 
you can select one fourth, you can select one over 100, one over 1,000. It turns out that three fourths is close to what uh, gets the best ratio. Okay. But you know, if you select 99% here, it's pretty good because that means that the irreducible means that the path is very, very long. So, so this, uh, this, this uh, means that in the lift, you would intuitively visit a lot of vertices. So that might be better for intuition. Three fourth is just a number. It's, I, I don't know of any deep reason. So, so let me now just uh, quickly explain why intuitive we are done. And that's the vertebrate pierce. So, and here the basic idea is the following. Okay, so now we only have to consider reducible instances. But if you think about it, they're almost node weighted instances. So let me explain what I mean. And that, uh, then, the, then the question I, that uh, was uh, pre, uh, just uh, posed will make even more sense. Okay, I mean, it made perfect sense <laughs> yes before, but it, it will be very timely now, okay? So because not only I will assume 99% that the path crosses 99%, here I will assume that it crosses everything. So suppose you have an instance that is perfectly reducible, meaning that the contraction of any set causes no decrease in the LP value. Furthermore, suppose that the lamina family contains all the singletons, so every vertex has a node weight. Okay. Then, when the contracting a set, the LP decrease is proportional to the number of sets not crossed by the worst way to enter and exit. Okay. So basically, since we assume that we are perfectly reducible, the worst way to enter and exit must visit all the vertices because otherwise the contraction would lead to a decrease in LP value. So now you I think you, if you think about your question, right, now it makes perfect sense. Suppose I would define instead of using three fourth, I would use like 99%, 0.999%. That means that even in the quantitative approach, I will visit 99.999% of the vertices. Now I do a, like a qualitative statement. To simplify things, I say we are perfectly reducible. There is no drop in value at all. That means that we will actually there exists a way of entering and exit so that the shortest path visits everything. Okay. <clears throat> so now, in this perfectly reducible world, well, what we can do is just to contract all the maximal sets in our lamina family. Okay. So now we just have single vertices, and the lamina family only contains the singletons. This is what we call the node weighted case because the weight of an edge is just the node weights, the sum of the node weights. Okay, so this is a node weighted instance. We have a 28 approximation. Just find the 28 approximation tor. And now we lift it back to a tor in the original instance with one tweak. Okay, so here I enter this set and I exit this set here. In the lift, right, we added the shortest path between these two vertices. Now what we'll do is to first add a shortest path to the worst way to enter, then the shortest path from the worst way to enter to the worst way to exit, followed by shortest path from the worst way to exit to the, uh, to the way we wanted to exit. I do the same thing here. I add a shortest path to the worst way to enter, a shortest path to the worst way to exit, <clears throat> finally a shortest path to the worst way to enter. I only do that the first time I visit uh, the set. So here I don't need to do it. So I just continue. Now in, the, in this set here, I do the same thing. So I add a shortest path to the worst way to enter, shortest path to the worst way to exit, followed by shortest path from the worst way to exit. Uh, no, from the worst way to exit to the way I exit. So this is the way I build uh, build my, uh, my 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 tour. So again, it's not maybe clear for you that all these path, shortest paths exist, but they do exist. Okay, so what's the what's the so we got a tor because we assume it to be perfectly reducible. What's the cost of a tor? It's the weight of the lift plus the weight of all these paths that I added. Okay, so the weight of the lift was just 28 times opt because we used a 28 approximation for the node weighted case. Now to organ uh, uh, to we have to worry about the weight of the paths. So we added three paths inside each set. One can prove that each of these paths only crosses 
each uh, it enters each tight set at most once, meaning that each path has value at most LP value inside this set. We have so we have three times the value of this set inside this set, plus three times the LP value inside this set, plus three times the LP value inside this set. So in total, the total cost of the path will be three times opt. So so the total cost will be 31 times opt. Okay. <clears throat> So this is the intuition why irreducible are very helpful. In particular, if we had a perfect irreducible, meaning that no contraction drops the LP value plus the null weights, that means that there exists a way to enter an exit so that the shortest path visits everything. And this is very helpful because then we can just rewire the, the tour in the contracted instance into a tour in the completed instance. So of, of course, uh, in, the, uh, in general, the, you don't have this perfect irreducibility. So instead of finding a tor, you will find what we call a backbone that intuitively visits almost everything. In particular, it crosses all the non-singleton sets in our lamina family. And using this, yeah, we call B is called the backbone, and together instance, they form a vertebrate pair. That, then we complete this using a connection to local connectivity, TSP, and circulations. So I, I decided to, to, to focus on the reductions, but this part, uh, Laszlo talks a little bit uh, in a recorded talk uh, that he gave at Simon's Institute. So I think uh, I can refer you to that talk or talk to me or Jakob or Laszlo in person or to me later about that. So I decided to explain to you why reducibility is very helpful. Perfect reducibility actually gives you a tour. And, and uh, intuitively, you get the backbone that this is 99% of the stuff. Now you have to complete it. You can do it. So, so summary and open questions. <clears throat> so we get this constant approximation with respect to carp relaxation. It's based on a sequence of reductions that um, add more and more structure. We arrive to the reducible instance and vertebrate peers. It intuitively almost solved the problem here. So I hope that I gave you the appetite that either you can complete the, try to complete the, solve this yourself, maybe you do it in a more beautiful way, or I gave you the appetite to look in the paper how we do it. Um, I can also, uh, so we also have a 10 page summary on our, on our home pages that uh, gives an overview of these reductions. So, <clears throat> These are highly modular, so you can read this one day, the other, the other day, third day, and fourth day, and so on. So that's an advantage. But it also lo makes you, uh, lo you lose a constant. You know, you lose a constant of 8, 4, here you lose 29 or 30. So if you want to get close to 2, you cannot lose a constant in each reduction. So the way to get down to a couple of hundreds even is to lose this very modular structure and highly specialize the different parts to the to framework. So this is a pretty big price to pay if we can only get down to a couple of hundreds and that's why we didn't do it. So that would be a much more complicated paper, I think. But even if you would specialize things, we have no, we have, we have, a, we don't know how to get close to two close to 10, even close to 50 would be very interesting. So here, the technique we used in the first reduction was this amazing power of LP duality. Here we use the recursive approach is fine as long as opt drops. Uh, here we behave, use that the irreducible instance actually behaves as node weighters. We can use the constant factor approximation algorithm for that case to get a tor, almost a tor. That, that almost a tor we call a backbone, and together with the instance we call it a vertebrate pair, that we complete using the connection to local connectivity and circulations that I, that I didn't cover. So I think some of the hot open questions is, is the right ratio too. As I explained, we, you need new IDs, definitely. Uh, one very nice question is bottleneck ATSB. So here, you're given a graph, a complete graph with edge weights that satisfy the triangle inequality. Now you want to find a Hamiltonian cycle that minimizes the max weight edge. So I think this is a nice question in itself. It, uh, there is a tight answer for the symmetric case, which is two, that has been known for several decades. But uh, still, there is uh, only a super constant algorithm uh, for ATSP, bottleneck ATSP. 
and the lower bound I think is only two. And so this is an interesting question itself, and it's also motivated by, uh, I would say, the thin tree conjecture, which is, remains a very interesting question. So is there a tree, well, T, such that for every cut, the number of edges that crosses that cut is proportional to what the LP value tells you? That's the question. And, if it, and it's known that the thin tree conjecture, if true, would imply a constant factor approximation for bottleneck ATSB. So this could be seen as a slightly easier problem than fin tree conjecture, or in the counterpositive, if you could prove that the bottleneck ATSB has no constant factor, then that would show that there is no constant fin tree. And one of the questions we are interested in is also uh, no weight to symmetric TSB. So somehow here, no weight ATSB was important for no weight to symmetric TSB. Nothing is known better than Christophides. Okay, so thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Ola. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions? So, so, uh, uh, so do you, do you, do you uh, is there like a, uh, is this possible to give any hint on how the local connectivity thing works? So it's yeah, yeah, uh, of course, yes. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so, um, so let me just try. So, um, so let me see here. I had set something up. But, uh, Try this just quickly. Okay, so so yes, uh, explain you what the problem is. Okay, so so in ATSP, right? You want to find a tor. Can you see this? Yes. Well, actually, it doesn't work because. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, I don't think it works. Uh, that's okay. Don't worry about it. Uh, so, uh, oh, now it works. Ah. <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry. So, in, in so you are, in ATSP, right? You have a graph with a bunch of nodes, and you want to find a tor that connects all of them. In local connectivity ATSP, you are given a partition of the vertices. Okay. Uh, and now I only ask you to find a collection of subtors so that each partition is crossed at least once. So you can have a red subtor that crosses these two partitions. You could have a blue subtor that crosses these partitions. You don't need to connect the whole tor, but you need to cross these subpartitions. Now the objective function says that each of these subtors have to locally be good. So I don't, that's a little bit complicated to define, but we knew how to solve this in a node weighted case. Okay, and now we have reduced our case to this uh, vertebrate pier where we have a backbone that almost visits everything. Okay, so now what we can do is that this behaves like the node weighted case. Uh, if we can connect these vertices to this vertex, then we are part of the backbone. Connect this vertex to that vertex and so on. So inside, if we don't cross any non singleton tight sets, the objective function behaves like the node weighted. So basically, we connect everything as long as we can in a node weighted approach, and then we pay one time up to connect it to the backbone. But yes, it gets, uh, that was not a crystal clear explanation, but uh, uh, basically when we had have this backbone, we have almost a node weighted case. But I, I'm not able to explain it a better way. Yeah. No, uh, thank you. No, that, that was great. So, so you're saying like, if it was completely, um, forget the name you used, if it was actually the node weighted, the it was the exact backbone, then it would be, uh, you will be yeah. in the node And okay, so there's some robust version of. Oh, so if it was perfectly reducible, we actually found a backbone that visited yeah. every vertex. So then we are done. Okay. So then, then, then there is nothing to do. So you should think of it, right? We find a backbone that visits 99% of everything. That's great. Any other questions? Okay, if there are no other questions, we'll take this offline. So a couple of things, so again, a reminder uh, that uh, the 
uh, if, a week from now, we have a Vinod Vaikundanthan speaking on cryptography. Uh, so that's a week from now, not two weeks. Uh, so we hope, uh, hope you join us then. And also today there was supposed to be 15, uh, an audience of 15. So we had uh, about 20 YouTube viewers and five of them were supposed to be on the Hangout, but uh, that would be my mistake. So I'll get fired from this job. Uh, uh, so uh, anyway, uh, thank you for joining us. I'll, I'll take it offline, but you're welcome to stay.